Welcome back everybody! Today we are continuing our exploration of the amazing Star Wars modding community and for that reason I have again a special guest, a very unique content creator of Star Wars Battlefront 2. Hello then Bo, nice to meet you. Yeah, hi there, nice to meet you. I basically played most of your maps today to prepare myself for this interview. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you did some very unique stuff here. But before we go into it, I would like to know a little bit about yourself. Basically, who are you and what do you enjoy in life? Well, um, what I do outside of modding has very little to do with modding. I know a lot of other modders ended up going to work in game development. Uh, I kind of chose a different route. Currently, I'm a math and physics tutor, and I'm working on earning my teaching credential. But basically, I was only in my late teens when I was active in the Battlefront modding scene, and then after that, I ended up getting my bachelor's and master's degrees in astrophysics. And I did a little research in grad school studying like how planets formed, but I found that I enjoyed talking to people about astrophysics way more than researching it, which is kind of how I got into teaching. That's kind of where I'm at right now, is just trying to get uh, credentials so that I can start teaching in my own classroom. That's very interesting and very unique also for this show here, this uh, YouTube channel. I guess you're the first teacher yeah, or you, you're the first astrophysics on this podcast show. It's really nice, especially since I play so many sci-fi games. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it they, they kind of go hand in hand. My love of sci-fi and uh, sci-fi games and modding Battlefront and whatnot. It's kind of when led to the other. And when was your first contact with Star Wars? Oh, I've loved Star Wars as long as I can remember. I mean, I must have seen the original trilogy when I was like four or five or six or something, and I was just hooked on it. I had them all on VHS. It was the, not the, I think I had a couple of the original VHSs, but then the um, the first special edition VHS before they had DVDs, where like before the movie, they had like two hours of George Lucas just rambling on about the movies, like uh, in an interview beforehand. Anyway, I, I watched all of those, I don't know, must have been dozens or hundreds of times. I was absolutely hooked on them. And then, of course, the prequels and whatnot came out, and I've always just been a huge fan of Star Wars. When Battlefront came out, uh, that was like 2004, so I would have been about 14. And I think I just spotted it on a shelf, like the CD case. And I picked it up and looked at it, and it looked really cool, and so I got it. <laughs> so that's pretty much how I got into it. And actually, the save profiles for the original Star Wars Battlefront 1 were originally hooked to your username that you would go on to use in multiplayer. Um, I didn't realize that I was making the profile, and so when I made the profile, I just came up with like a Star Wars-y sounding name. And that's where like the Dan Boeing came from, and that's just became my handle in multiplayer. And I eventually shortened it to Dan Bo, which is what I use today, but that's where that ended up coming from, the Battlefront. And you switched immediately then to Battlefront 2, or did you stay with the original for a while? Hmm. I, th I feel like the lifetime of the original Battlefront was pretty short. I think pretty much as soon as the second one came out, we were all playing the second one. I was in a, a clan called SBF, which uh, stood for Skilled Bantha Fodders. <laughs> Any Star Wars fans will know what that means. Um, Perfect name. Yeah, and uh, so we uh, met for, during the first Battlefront, and it carried over into the second one. And I think we pretty much went to the second one and never looked back. And what basically motivated you then to make your own maps and dive into modding a little bit? Um, this wasn't actually the first game I made a mod for. Uh, about a year before that, I don't know if you've heard of it there was this other first person shooter series called the delta force series there was like delta force land warrior that was that i really enjoyed playing and then this game called delta force black hawk down came out and that was like 2003 and um it came with a whole set of modding tools and documentation that came with it um that you could access from their website i think and so i thought that was really cool oh i get to make my own custom levels that's so, that's really neat and so i downloaded it and taught myself how to make custom levels using their little uh, editor. Um, and then when Battlefront came out, I immediately looked to see if I could mod it like I did the Delta Force game. And lo and behold, they also had modding tools. I feel like a lot of games did back then, or at least there was an era where they did. 
not so much anymore these days but um yeah there's the the zero editor which was the main like level designer um for that game and all the documentation associated with that so i basically just taught myself how to use all that stuff and then soon discovered um and i don't remember how i discovered it the game toast community which was the modding community for battlefront and so between the documentation and the forum that's kind of basically how i learned how to mod for it and how was your welcome party basically at the game toast community i hate so many good stories already um man this was so long ago and i know i really honestly don't even remember how i found out about game toast whether i learned about it from a player in game or a google search or um what but i found out about it oh you know what it was is i think i was looking for mods for battlefront and uh i think at the time they were hosted on Filefront, and I think that eventually led me to Game Toast, and I think I just lurked on there for a while before like posting or anything. And it wasn't until I started making my own stuff, and I had already come out with a couple maps before I actually made an account and started posting on there. But honestly, I couldn't tell you what <laughs> uh, you know my experiences were on there. I think as I became a bit more renowned in my map making i was a bit more active on there but in the early days i don't remember it too well so you basically learned everything by yourself as far as level design go yeah as i made more maps i learned more stuff and i got a lot more collaborative help from game toast but in the early days i was pretty much just working on my own and was this <laughs> easy back then because we, we didn't have youtube or any guides you know it's it's weird um I think about it now and like I I mean I just spend hours and hours and hours of my free time just working on it, you know. And uh you're right. There I mean th these days I would look up, you know, to see if there was a Discord channel for the game or, you know, YouTube videos and all these crazy resources, but all that back then there was just basically whatever documentation the developers gave you and that was it. And then, you know, forums were the popular Uh, sort of kind of community online back then and so it was basically just that and so everything that wasn't in the documentation modders basically had to figure out for themselves and so a lot of the things that i kind of figured out with how to edit units and stuff was just by looking through the files and trying to mess with them and seeing what happened <laughs> a lot of trial and error oh yes lots of error some trial <laughs> <laughs> and what was basically the result Can you give me a short summary of all the maps you did in Battlefront 2? Uh, well, I can try to keep it short. I did a lot of different maps in a like, very relatively short span of time now that I think about it. Now, the first couple that I made were nothing particularly special. I think the very first one I made was basically just a hero assault map that had like a temple in the middle. But there was really, it was just like a simple level, nothing fancy about it. Um, I then made this map called Hypori Grievous Attacks, which was set on the planet that was featured in, I don't know if you saw the original 2D animated Clone Wars that Gendy Tarkovsky did, that came up before the 3D uh, Clone Wars. But that's where the character General Grievous was introduced even before Revenge of the Sith came out. And uh, I was a huge fan of General Grievous back then, uh, before we saw him in the in live action and George Lucas's own interpretation of the character. He was really like a very scary character in the 2D animation film, and so I tried to capture that in that map. And I remember playing with my clan members where uh, we would take turns where several players would be Jedi hiding in this crashed frigate in the center of the map, and one player would control General Grievous, who I figured out how to modify him to give him extra health. Um, so they would be really like difficult to beat, and we'd kind of take turns uh, being General Grievous in that. But in order to do that, I had to figure out how to edit General Grievous's health, and that basically uh, was opening Pandora's box because I figured out how to edit these things called ODF files, which is where all the sort of properties of weapons and units and vehicles was all very cleanly enumerated. So it was like this setting equals this number, and all you had to do was basically change a number and you could get it to whatever you wanted it to be without really having to know much code, which was perfect for, you know, 14 year old me or whatever and so um 
of course, having learned how to do that, my first instinct was to make everything as absurdly overpowered as possible. So, you know, firing hundreds of rockets and bullets in all directions all at once. And I put it all together in a map, and I called it the Realm of Chaos. And that kind of ended up becoming my trademark for all my maps that had these chaos units with wild and overpowered weapons and custom skins. And so there was uh, Boris II Stunt Course, which was like a sandbox-style map that was built around like the idea of an obstacle course with these super fast vehicles you could do uh stunts launching yourself into the air it also had like a little paintball course off in a secluded part of the map there was uh renvar temple which basically took the battlefront one map renvar citadel and then expanded it so that um it covered like a much larger territory and then i put all my chaos units in it and one of the things i remember from that one that i really liked is that um in the battlefront like you could call um a recon droid that could then send down like an orbital bombardment and i took that orbital bombardment and turned it into something that looked like one big giant uh death star laser that would come down and fling ai off the cliffs which was uh really funny also had a mode where you could play as these giant godzilla sized wampas and fight all these little tiny ai shooting chain guns at you or vice versa there was also the cage match which was a very tiny uh claustrophobic map that was filled to the brim with units and all the same sort of chaos units. But then you could actually break out of the cage by shooting like one of the walls. And that would get you into the outside of the map, which was loaded with like Easter eggs in an entirely hidden arena up in the sky. They could reach with this like buggy elevator. Then there was Christmas in Jinglin Town, which was uh, my entry into a Christmas map competition on Game Toast. I think I was one of the only people that actually ended up having a finished map by the end of it. But um, Rather than that being built around my chaos units, I made everything just, you know, very snowball and Christmas themed. So all the guns uh, just shot snowballs and Christmas presents. And there was also a mode where you could play as Ewoks fighting Jawas, throwing snowballs at each other and constructing little snow forts out of deployable walls and whatnot. There was also Pepperland Psychedelia, which was inspired by me getting into 60s psychedelic rock in my late teens, particularly like the Beatles, among other things. So everything was made to be like this hippies acid trip complete with beetles as playable units and their uh, yellow submarine as a vehicle that you could fly through the air. And there was this fun mode where you could play these um, anthropomorphic flower people with guns <laughs> fighting Geonosians that I had re or, uh, a friend of mine had reskinned into uh, looking like these weird butterflies. And then lastly, there was Battle of the Titans, which was like my best of map that Kind of took all the stuff from my other maps and put them into one and the same kind of setting that the realm of chaos was in so those were all the kind of main maps that i did that i was known for there was a couple other ones that i did that i didn't really release as officially as those ones but people probably wouldn't be terribly familiar with them i don't even remember what i called them i think there was like a sniper practice map that i made and uh one that i made for a friend of mine who is in this uh, JT clan called Jet Troopers that was based around that, basically. But yeah, that was <laughs> my lengthy career in Battlefront 2, which I think all was released within the span of like two years, which sounds insane to me now because it seemed like an entire lifetime, those two years working on that stuff. But yeah, that was it. <laughs> oh, I really would have thought you did this over, let's say, eight or ten years two years hmm? not bad no oh no this was like i mean i started you know when battlefront 2 first came out and then i think the last one i released was the second version of pepperland and that came out late 2008 i think and that was pretty much all i did for battlefront 2 so that was only in the you know the span of like two and a half years at most i find it also very interesting that you decided to go in the funny mapping direction most models or mappers i met on the internet either started by doing basically their their schools their bedrooms or re recreating anything they saw on the tv but going on the funny side it's not unheard heard of but it's rare can you maybe remember why you did go in that direction <laughs> Yeah, um, so I was inspired by a map that came out for Battlefront 1. 
I tried to look it up earlier and I couldn't really find it for sure. And my memory of it is different than what I was able to find. I think it was, um, let's see, uh, it was like Raxus Prime or something. Um, Raxus Prime. Uh, there's a couple maps that were named that because that's like a planet name, but there was Raxus Prime Junkyard or something. It was basically this big open sort of Genosia and like uh, desert expanse, but it had a lot of units all in one space. And I just loved the chaos of all these AI like shooting everywhere. And it was really intense compared to like a lot of the, you know, default maps. And so I really enjoyed that sort of chaotic atmosphere. And so I just, once I learned how to like make the game even more chaotic than usual with uh, editing all the files, I just, you know, it was fun. So everything was just kind of, you know, geared towards just having a really, you know, fun, crazy experience. It wasn't meant to be like, you know, canon within the Star Wars, you know, expanded universe or anywhere. It was just basically made for fun, like its own dimension of Star Wars. <laughs> I wonder, did you ever consider doing some space maps in that direction? Like the ones with like space battles with X-Wings and stuff? Exactly. Um, I can't remember. I wasn't really much into the space fighting maps on Battlefront 2, so I didn't spend a whole lot of time there. I feel like I must have considered at one point, but those were always just kind of very vehicle driven maps. And I, I loved um, getting to play with the infantry a lot more. And a lot of my maps did have like X-Wings and stuff on them, but you could fly them from, you know, the ground level. And so I guess I just was never really interested in only doing like exclusively like X-Wing and stuff battles and stuff like that. Okay, so more uh, ground player. Yeah. That's totally fine. I mentioned it also in another interview about Battlefront maps. It's very rare that you have a Christmas style gameplay in any sense in gaming. So really thank you for creating this. It's nice. <laughs> it's especially nice for a content creator on YouTube to have something for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, well, you can thank whoever made the competition back in, I don't know, 2007 or whatever on Game Toast, because that's why I made it was uh, was for that competition. I just liked the idea of having a Christmas map and I wanted to give my go at it with uh, making crazy units. And I had uh, attained a little bit of a, a following among the Game Toast community of other monitors who liked what I did and wanted to help. And so out of all my... Uh, maps that I did, that one's probably the one that I was most proud of, just because there was a lot of love and collaboration went into that map. Um, and it's kind of different than my other ones, since my other ones are all based around kind of my units. This one was really kind of a group effort in terms of like all the custom models and uh, textures and scripting and stuff that went into it. And so that it was really cool to work on that. And we only worked on it in just a matter of months, because I don't remember when they started the competition, I think it was probably like the summer of that year. And so in just a matter of months, we were able to put the whole thing together. It wasn't done before Christmas. I think it came out like on New Year's or something. I think because like of the deadline for the competition and when you were actually allowed to release it after the competition or something, I can't remember, but it was just done in a matter of months. And so it was really cool that we were able to put all that together, together, you know, in a, such a collaborative atmosphere. Well, you did an amazing job for such a short time of development. Did you ever play Return to Jingle in town? I, did I ever return to playing it or was there like another version? No, no. Um, there's another version, basically. Uh, a modder called Mars 8880 basically did a reimagine, a remastering of your map and he called it Return to Jingle in town. Yeah, okay, I think I have played that. So there's this group of people that play Christmas, uh, the Christmas and Jingle in Town, like, every Christmas. And they've been doing this for many years now. And I think when I joined them one of the years, we played that version of it, and it had, like, an additional mode on there that had, like, extra Christmas-themed heroes. Is that the one that you're talking about? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have played that. Yeah, it was cool. And it's <laughs> really cool that, you know, I mean, I made that map, like, what? 17 years ago, <laughs> something like that. And it's people are still playing it. That's wild to me. I thought, you know, the community that would be playing would have died off and long been, you know, forgotten about. 
Well, that's the unique thing, I would say, if you have games which include mod support, those maps, those projects survive. It's, it's so good. Yeah, they live a long time. And it's so sad that we don't have this anymore. It's so rare, at least. Well, as the games get a lot more complex, it gets a lot harder and more involved to actually try to make a mod of one. Back then, the games were just, you know, simpler. You know, there wasn't as much detail in, like, the, the physics engine or all these other considerations. And so as, like, games get more advanced, like, making mods for them gets so advanced that developers don't even feel like <laughs> offering mod support anymore. They're like, no, you're on your own. Or might be against it altogether because they're worried about people using it to cheat in their, like, online versions or whatever. Well, I would say it's more the last thing you mentioned because if the developer decided from the beginning we create modding tools, it shouldn't be a problem. So many games before did it. Of course, they were a little bit simpler, but the core principles are the same. And there are still games out there who do support mods like Synth of Solar Empire or the Arma series. So it's still doable. The developer teams or the studios just have to say, hey, we support the community. Yeah, I, I do miss those days where, because um, I, I mean, that's how I got into modding is because the developers offered all this documentation on how to do it. <laughs> it was like, here's how to modify our game. Have fun with it. You know, that was kind of the atmosphere back then. Now you have to really go searching for it in order to figure out how to mod stuff. But going back to your maps, did you do everything alone or did you uh, basically use your clan members as beta testers? Did you have basically some help? I did most of like the level design, modifying unit weapons and vehicle properties, retexturing on my own. I knew a little bit of LUA scripting, which is the script that they used for like how the gameplay worked. But beyond that, I didn't really know how to do anything involving like custom models or sound. And so I got like a lot of help in that regard, mostly from the Game Toast community. Pretty much all my maps, for the most part, featured like a custom soundtrack that you probably heard while you were playing them that involved like various kinds of rock music playing in the background that I basically remixed together into a single file. I sent it to a friend of mine on Game Toast. I think his name was Phazon Elite. And he helped me with the sounds on pretty much all of my maps. So he was a frequent collaborator. And with custom models, there was a lot of people that helped me with that. Some people just had models that they had created for the game or for their own maps or stuff uh, like Psycho Fred. And others just let me use their models or helped me help make models specifically for my map, uh, like Frag Me and uh, Eight Guts, Thunder, Alib. I'm sure there was many others, uh, but yeah. Oh, and um, Maveritual big name in that modding community helped me a lot with the scripting sides of things. You just mentioned that you had some help. Maybe can you also remember whether some big problems, even with help, you couldn't solve? Yeah, so it the engine definitely had its limits. And of course, my maps were all about driving the game to its absolute limits. <laughs> I wanted to make things as absolutely chaotic and insane as possible. That was my whole prerogative making my maps. And so there's definitely a limit to how much can be loaded and rendered at a time in the game. And the game had these memory pools that uh, were put in place. And once you maxed out any of those memory pools, the game would just close. It would just crash itself and being like, no, you overfilled this memory pool. But a lot of the time, it wouldn't actually give you an error code. It would just crash. And you have to be like, OK, I have no idea why that happened. And you would just have to keep trying to change different parts of this script, uh, change the sizes of certain memory pools, which you could do with LUA script a little bit. And, but some of those memory pools were hard coded, which means you couldn't change them. And we didn't know exactly what all of those were. And so sometimes it would just crash and you would have no idea why. And it would just be like, there's just too much stuff going on is basically what was going on. And so there was a lot of trial and error a lot of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to accomplish always had to be cut down in some way just so I could get my maps to actually run. There was one map that I made called Madness Incorporated, and it was set 
indoors for the most part, which required like a lot of interior structure, lots of objects. And so the level designer itself mostly just did terrain and you placed objects on the terrain. And so because of all the objects that I placed on there to get the map made, I think it just overloaded the game a bit. So that just ended up not working at all. And I just gave up on it. <laughs> so I guess you had a few features you couldn't realize because <laughs> engine limitation or other stuff. Yeah, I think there were some elements of that map that I was able to bring into it, my Battle of the Titans map, but most of it I just very sadly gave up on just because like I had spent months trying to get it to work and I couldn't get it to work without deleting huge portions of the map. <laughs> so it was just fundamentally not going to work without me learning how to like model my own interior, which wasn't an option for me back then. Can you remember one big thing you wanted really, really to include, but couldn't? Um, I think it was all just along the lines of wanting to add more to the map. I wanted the maps to be bigger, like actually physically, like there was a limit uh, to like the size of the grid of the entire map that you could have. And you could set that while you're making it. But uh, if you try to set it really big, that would make the map like way less stable and it would crash again without explanation. And so I ended up making, uh, tried making a new version of Pepperland that was, you know, on a bigger map and it all put together it was pretty much all there. And then it, it wasn't working. And it was because the map was too big. And so I had to redesign the whole thing again, like smaller in order to get to work. And so that was always frustrating. Uh, you know, it was a constant battle between the amount of content that I wanted and the stability and actually being playable. <laughs> And it would have been nice to be able to make custom structures uh, without having to rely on third-party modeling programs to like insert the models as objects. I think the way that the game handled that was like very unoptimized, which is why it was so difficult to do compared to like other games like Source Games uh, have Hammer Editor, where you can actually build structures out of you know polygons as a part of the level, as in addition to adding objects. So. It would have been nice to have a bit more features in that, but it was an old game that the engine had its limitations. Were the tools really good in the sense of were they stable or did they crash a lot? <laughs> uh, they were not stable. Um, I remember many times uh, where the editor would crash and I would lose all my work because I didn't save in the last you know 30 minutes. I don't think there was an autosave feature. So you just had to remember to save periodically. And so if it crashed, you would lose everything. Ouch. And yeah, it, I mean, as a level editor, it got the job done. I mean, you could morph the terrain and paint textures on it and uh, add your objects and rotate them around and uh, other triggered events and things. But they were fairly simple for the time, but they left a little to be desired for sure. I feel like Zero Editor has a little bit inf infamous for how unstable it was. I think a lot of other people uh, turned to using another editor that I never really learned uh, about because I think it came out fairly late into my Battlefront tenure. And after thinking of all these negative aspects of your maps, what were your positive things you can remember? What is your favorite, basically? Well, as I mentioned, uh, Christmas in Jingling Town is probably the one I'm most proud of, just because of all the work and effort that went into it, and how you got, it's really just a very special and unique kind of environment that I have a lot of nostalgia for. And the sort of music that I put on all my maps was all very nostalgic for the type of music that I really liked at the time. Also added to that kind of environment that it was in, all very chaotic and psychedelic. I would say, aside from Christmas in Jingling Town, I am probably most proud of Renvar Temple. Renvar Citadel was always my favorite Battlefront map, which is why I wanted to expand on it, because it was set on this basically block-shaped cliff and would drop off on all sides. And I wanted to be like, well, what was down there, you know? And so I wanted to expand the whole map down into the, the chasm and up into the mountains. And that's kind of what inspired me to make that. And then I added my chaos units to it. And I did so many different modes to that with all different units in each one. Um, and I was able to get a uh, collaboration with the person who made a model for the Millennium Falcon 
as well as the Ebon Hawk from the uh, KOTOR, Knights of the Old Republic. And uh, yeah, that, that, that just had a, so much content in it, and it was a lot of work and effort. And I have fond memories of it, and fond memories of playing the mode with the, the giant Wampas. <laughs> yeah, they are very <laughs> special. <laughs> I never saw a hunt mode, basically, where you had such huge creatures to kill, or they killed you most of the time. And after leaving Battlefront 2, did you stay in the Battlefront franchise in the sense of you expanded to the other games, or did you just leave the Star Wars gaming entirely? Um, it kind of trailed off after a while. I think around the same time period, um, the other members of my clan weren't as active. And so once I didn't have any friends that were like actively playing it anymore, I didn't really play it anymore either. And that's right about the time that I was getting into Team Fortress 2 and Left 4 Dead. And so I kind of just migrated over to those games. And so I didn't really do a lot with Battlefront after that. Um, I loved the EA Battlefronts that came out eventually in the 2010s. I especially liked the second one that came out in like 2017. Uh, we had always been wanting a Battlefront 3 for, you know, since they first announced it and then canceled it. Or it was put into a never-ending development cycle where we got no updates about it and it was constantly all the speculation about whether it would come out or not and then everybody just figured that it was canceled. But basically the EA Battlefronts kind of gave us what we always wanted out of like a third Battlefront, especially the second one. The first one I remember lacking a bit of content and it was really great graphics. It was awesome to be in that kind of Star Wars environment with such good graphics. But other than that, the, the gameplay was a little bit repetitive. But the second Battlefront brought back a lot of the kinds of features that were in the original Battlefronts with uh, all the different types of heroes that you could be, the different types of modes. They eventually added co-op. It was great. I remember there was a lot of controversy when it first came out, but I feel like over time they really, really fleshed it out and made it a terrific game. It's true, but sadly you mentioned those many modes and maps. But what it's really missing is a, is a good in-game... Modding support. That's one, yeah, that's another one. But a good in-game browser. You can't really select the maps or the modes you want to play. It's really random. Yeah, that's another thing that, like, new games don't have anymore. They all, everything is, you know, engagement-driven matchmaking that keeps you playing the game rather than allowing players to choose the servers that they join. So it's much less community driven, you know, like Battlefront had all these different bubbles of different communities associated with it. But most of these games is just the overall community of the game because everybody's stuck in the same matchmaking system. There's no way out of it. <laughs> and it's so sad because in, in the good old Counter-Strike days, for example, you had a giant list of maps and you made a, a map cycle and sometimes there were rare maps not all players liked but they were just in the cycle and so they were played at least yeah but having only matchmaking those maps or those game modes yeah they are dead basically sometimes you can't even find a match in battlefront 2 when it's right. wednesday there is the triple xp uh, event basically and yeah it's that still there it's so sad they would cycle in and out various modes i remember when they first came out with uh, their ewok mode was a big hit but then you know they only had a limited amount of player base and as soon as they add another mode the people are playing that mode instead of the other modes and so then they took it out and they put it back in and you know they didn't offer all of the game modes at the same time simply because like you know matchmaking would be empty because there wasn't enough play po people playing them I do remember um, eventually the second EA Battlefront was revived for a bit, and it might still be, I think it is, uh, by like a custom dedicated uh, server system and modding system. Um, I forget what it was called. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, I want to say it's Kyber, but I'm not entirely sure. Anything. Yes, yeah, it was Kyber. They had a big update uh, just, I think in April, just a few weeks ago, basically where they um, integrated also a mod launcher and installing mods should be easier, but it's still very restrictive, sadly. 
Yeah, I remember that had a dedicated server browser though, I think, right? Yeah, but st still you have the problem that you can't decide how many bots are on the maps. You have a co-op mod. I love co-op in any game, in any franchise, I love it. But why only give us a pool of eight maps if you have, say, 60 maps? Right. It's so, ah, uh, especially most of the other game modes have bots in the multiplayer matches. They are just on the side, they help you a little bit, not too strong, just most of the time cannon fodder, but why not give this to all players in co-op? It would yeah. basically make those games stay forever if it's only matchmaking. Uh, I don't think so, sadly. Yeah, I imagine with those, uh, they could have lasted indefinitely as long as there were people willing to host servers for them. Along those same lines, I was pretty disappointed with uh, Aspir or Asper, I don't know how to pronounce the developer. They did that um, just earlier this year, that re-release of the original Battlefronts, which was a cool idea. And I feel like they had a decent amount of time to work on it, but I played it and I feel like they did very, they added very little and what they changed didn't really make it better. <laughs> it broke a lot of stuff and I ended up getting it refunded. I was so disappointed with it. It didn't seem like they offered much in the way of uh, supporting the modding committee either. I wondered if you did buy that or even heard about it. Yeah, I, I bought it and I talked with uh, a little bit with uh, some of the old guard of uh, modders that were still around. But I've been away from it for so long, I don't really remember a, a lot about how modding the game goes. And I tried porting over some of my maps and some of them worked, but there was just uh, graphical issues where I didn't know where to even begin with uh, having to fi fix it. And I just have a lot of other things going on right now and it just didn't really feel like it was worth the time. But I, if anybody else wanted to go and try to remaster my maps like the Return in Jinglin Town one, that's perfectly okay with me. But I'm probably not gonna be touching that stuff anymore. So I guess you answered the next question about the future of your maps. Sadly, there won't be any, from you at least. <laughs> no, not for, for me at least, unless uh, they come out with the new Battlefront came with a really good uh, modding tools in hand. <laughs> well, I would say we come slowly to a close to the Battlefront story of your modding, but I also want to know a little bit about your other modding or mapping experience. I saw you did some work in Left for That. Yeah, so I, my modding outside of that, um, even around the time that I was working on the Battlefront maps, I think I was working on an, a complete overhaul of this old Lego game called Rock Raiders. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it had its own little modding community called Rock Raiders Underground, or RU. It, the game had kind of a cult following. It was sort of like a real-time strategy game, but it was geared towards a fairly young audience, and so I basically remade all the levels and did a few custom levels to make it more challenging. It was called uh, Baz's Mod, um, since that was my handle in that community. And then after that, and after Battlefront, I made a custom map for Team Fortress 2 called Rocket Ravine, and that didn't really find its way onto any servers. <laughs> it was still fun to work on, and I tried to get it picked up on a few servers, but man, that game just had so many custom maps that it was, uh, it was just a surplus. <laughs> and so it was difficult to for new maps to catch on in that uh, community. And then I, after learning how to use the Source Engine to make the Team Fortress 2 map, I used it to work on a custom campaign for uh, originally the first Left 4 Dead is when I started working on it. But then of course Left 4 Dead 2 came out within like a year or so later. And so I eventually poured it all over my the work I had done so far, which was like maybe three out of the five maps that I wanted to do since campaigns in Left 4 Dead are usually a sequence of different levels that you go through. It's a zombie game, trying to make it from checkpoint to checkpoint. And so I made one called Daybreak. It's set in San Francisco. You kind of start in the city and then you work your way across the Golden Gate Bridge and then taking a boat over to Alcatraz Island where they have that old prison. And that's where the finale of the campaign takes place. And I spent it <laughs> a good five or six years uh, working on that campaign. It was a lot of work and off and on. And there was a lot of problems with it along the way and that I got so frustrated with it, I went on a hiatus from working on it. And then I eventually came back and working on it in 
finished up like the very first version in like 2013 and then uh, a newer version later in like 2021 and uh, so on. Currently, it has about 750,000 unique subscribers on the Steam Workshop, one of the top campaigns on the Steam Workshop that offers verses. And so I'm pretty proud of that one. Um, that's probably been my biggest modding project outside of uh, Battlefront. And since then, I haven't really done much modding aside from um, I have a group of uh, people that I play Left 4 Dead 2 with on the regular in Versus, and we do a lot of custom campaigns. But not all the campaigns are made particularly well for Versus, and so I'll make my own custom versions of those custom campaigns by editing them with a level editor, and then putting them as like an unlisted sort of spot on the workshop. So they aren't officially released since I don't want to infringe on you know any of the original works at all. I mainly just want to make it for um, you know, the group of players that I play with. And for a couple, if I eventually get them bug tested and whatnot, I might uh, try to reach out. Uh, well, I've already tried to reach out to a couple of the original developers uh, to see if uh, they'd be interested in supporting a, an official release of them or not. But that's not really my priority with them like it was with Daybreak. Besides of the Source engine, did you also try other game engines? Uh, no, that was pretty much it. I mean, I am somewhat involved in the Lethal Company modding community, although I haven't really made any mods for that game specifically. I've been working on a mod pack, which requires doing a lot of configuration so that uh, in that game, it's uh, like this survival loop of trying to go to these various moons, collect scrap, bring it back like a roguelike until you are not able to meet quota anymore. And so I am been working on a mod pack that includes a wide variety of moons that have all been configured with uh, custom scrap, custom interiors, and custom moons uh, put together. And so there's a whole lot of mo uh, maps and mods for that game. And so I've been trying to collect them together into a cohesive mod pack that can be shared between players. Uh, so that's not really like strictly modding or creating a mod so to speak but just working within the modding community so uh, there's that but aside from source mod i haven't really done uh much stuff i haven't done anything for like counter strike or anything like that or uh, uh other mods since then i think most of the multiplayer games that i've been playing since left 4 dead 2 and i'm still playing left 4 dead 2 uh, i played a bit of like player unknowns battlegrounds for a while and then uh call of duty but I haven't really been doing uh, a lot of multiplayer gaming uh, outside of Left 4 Dead 2 besides those. Well, it's a good game. Can't blame you. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the, the two games I have the most hours in is probably the Star Wars Battlefront 2, the original one, and Left 4 Dead 2. Both probably thousands. Not bad, not bad. But coming slowly to a close, I would now open the mic to you. Is there anything you would like to add? Anything we missed? Uh, not really. I just thought it was really cool that uh, uh, people are even interested in hearing about this stuff. Uh, I, it's weird to think about. Some people have reached out to me over the years and being like, hey, I grew up on your campaigns. That was like, whoa, oh, okay, you grew up on them. Uh, it made me feel old very instantly. But uh, also, it's just really cool to think about because, you know, that I mean, a lot of people did grow up with those games and those modern communities. And everybody gathering to play custom campaigns and uh, be a part of those communities was a big part of uh, people within a certain age group. And so everyone now, now and then, and uh, now and then again, I'll run into somebody on Reddit or uh, Discord or somewhere or Steam that's like, hey, I remember that you did this and I had no idea that you, and you also made Daybreak or whatever. And so I get uh, reached out to every now and again. And I think that's really cool that like Battlefront has such a lingering uh, community that's uh, still active about it and that's lasted so long. So it's really cool that people are still interested in it and uh, that you're doing all these interviews with uh, other moderators. I, I'm really uh, appreciative of, uh, of the interest and uh, uh, taking the time to talk to me about this stuff. It was really great. I just find it very important to archive this and yeah, hear your unique stories. Yeah, and I've been listening to some of your other interviews and uh, yeah, hearing what other uh, miners are doing nowadays. Well, then I say thank you for joining me and of course thank you for creating those amazing maps. They are very unique and I definitely You're will welcome. play them in the future <laughs> again, especially on LAN parties. I'm glad you enjoyed them. They're certainly something.
I tried playing them uh, somewhat recently. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> this is what I thought was really fun when I was 16. <laughs> those maps or th those types of maps are perfect, I think, for LAN parties. They are not that great for a lone play, if you're alone playing them. But if you're on a LAN Or if you have thing, epilepsy. If you um, basically haven't slept for eight or uh, 20 hours, <laughs> then they are perfect. Just chaos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, again, thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I would say that's it for this video. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think about the game. And of course, play the game. Until next time.